scripture, so if everyone would stand up, we'll ask God's blessing upon it. Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, Master, and Savior, honor and praises to you. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the understanding that you've given unto us. We ask that you will, Father, be glorified tonight in this study. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's go to Zechariah 4 again. Uh, the reason why, as I mentioned the last time we were going through this, is because human life, especially the males, the females, which are the only two we have, uh, are being devalued for money and for everything else. And I want to point out in the scriptures here the small things that God has done and show us and help us to see the value that he places upon everyone. And so this, this is why we're going back to Zechariah 4 and verse 10. He says here in Zechariah 4 and verse 10, I'll just read this. For who has despised the day of small things? And uh, we emphasize despise. Despise means to disrespect. We disrespect small people, small things. And when this Bible is filled with the small things in here that can help you see what you really are to God. So we're going to go over to the book of 2 Kings. And we're going to go through some things here that I'm going to ask Rose if she will start. This is 2 Kings 6 and verse 1 through 7. God does not have this Bible and the things that he has done in here just for filling up space is here to, so we can learn from it. So do learn from this tonight. Uh, let's go over to 2 Kings 6 and verse 1 through 7. Will you read those uh, seven verses, please, Mitt Rose? Yes, 2 Kings 6 and verses 1 through 7. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a, us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. Mm -hmm. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he shewed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee and put, and he put out his hand and took it. Thank you. Stop right there. That's a small thing, isn't it? It's small because here are the prophets, the son. These are students. They were taught by Elijah, then Elisha, and they are not well off. They are not rich. And he was, they were saying the places where we're living is too small. We need to get larger dwellings. So they went off, and as they were cutting down some trees, the axe head fell off fell into the water, and he said, it was borrowed in verse 5. Go to Exodus 22. Exodus 22, why is that so important? I, I, first time I read this, I said, ah, that's nothing. Exodus 22 and verse 14. Will you read that, please, Rose? Exodus 14 and verse 22 and verse, Exodus, Exodus 22 and verse 14 and verse 15. Listen to this. And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. But if the owner thereof be with it, he shall not make it good. If it be an hired thing, it came for his hire. There you are. That's why he said it's borrowed, meaning According to the laws they live by, the man that owned the axe head wasn't there. He borrowed that, this, this student borrowed the axe. And so when it fell into the water, 
he's going to have to make that good and they don't have that type of money. They're very, these students are very poor. And so he was saying it was borrowed. And Elijah, God's servant, said, where did it fall? He said, it fell right over there. He took a little stick, cut a little stick off a tree, threw it in there, and that ax head floated up. And he said, get it. He reached out and picked up the ax head and go back to work. And you say, well, what that, that's small. Yeah, that's very small. But those students needed that. We need it also. Things that seem very unimportant, very small, God is concerned about it. This was the man of God there. It's good to be around the people of God. Iron was expensive and rare in Israel at that time. The students were poor. God provided for the faithful. Elisha, Elisha and those students were being faithful to him during a hard time. And he caused an accident to float. He said, ah, it's not that bad. Yes, it is. You think about this, and, and the reason why I tell people when you go into your private closet, take your Bible with you. You're going through whatever it may be, and you can think this is too small for God. It, it, he doesn't, isn't concerned about that. Why not? There was a member of the church. He, they're deceased right now, but uh, they were having a difficult time financially. And for whatever reason, they got a real expensive hearing aid. He needed it very badly. And one day, for some whatever reason, he was walking around and it fell out or dropped out. Or, or he dropped it, lost it. And he was, wow, I can't replace that hearing aid. I can't. Where is it? And so he looked around and looked around and began to walk around. And he said, all at once, he looked over and he saw something like a little sparkling, a sparkling, that's, that's a little, little twinkle. And he looked over and said, oh, and he went over and there was a, that, that was his hearing aid down in some rocks, and, but it was had like a little light. And he picked it up, put it back in his ear, and that is. And he talked about that a long time because you don't, he didn't have money for another one. I think I've told the church about this also. We were going to the Feast of Tabernacles one year, second year of going to the feast, going between Santa Rosa and Fort Sumter, or Fort Sumner, I forgot which one, Sumter. Sumter. And I was pulling a little trailer the kind that you push up and the bed goes out on this end and the bed goes out on that end. And in the middle was a little small propane heater. And we were driving along there and I have a Valiant station wagon and all at once, the engine stopped. I'm the best mechanic this side of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it just stopped. And we were on that little two lane highway. And that, that, little, that little lane, so I pulled off as far as I could that big, that little trailer behind us. I went around front like you know, I raised the hood up and I looked down there and the motor was still there and everything, it looked great to me. And I didn't know what to do, not what to do. And, and we had been taught to pray. And I, when we, we first started attending the church, the ministers told us that they, had some, they didn't know everything, but always pray to God, go take it before God. So my wife and daughters were sitting in the car I walked over, away off the road over to a fence and stood there a few seconds. And I prayed to God. And I came back and I looked under the hood again, the same hood. <laughs> and there's a thing called a condenser. I didn't know what it was. I found out it was later on. Had a screw on this side and a screw on that side and a wire goes to those with screws. And one had come loose and that wire was loose. It was, it was moving. It was just flicking, just a little. I said, what's that? That's flicking, just maybe. Just moving just a little bit. I took the screw off, put the wire on it, fastened back up, got back in the car and started up like a new car. <laughs> I cannot forget that. that because that car, had, we had stopped a good nine or 10 minutes. It had stopped. That little wire was just moving, just, just a little bit and it caught my eye. And I'm not a mechanic. You know, I saw the motor, the train, you know, just whatever goes in. And there was one little, I put it on there and we drove that car, boom, took off down the road and went through the face. A little thing turned into something large. Seven days at the Feast of Tabernacles, and then the eighth day, and we drove back and didn't have that problem ever again. So look at these things and think about them sometimes. Uh, go over to Matthew 10 and verse 27. I want to ask Joshua to read this. Matthew 10 and verse 27. And think about an axe head. Think about some of your problems and troubles and th big things happen. Think about some of the small things also that seem so insignificant. 
Matthew 10, we don't, we don't speak out of this very often because of people don't like to because we look for the big thing. Matthew 10 and verse 27 to 31, Joshua. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. What you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear you not, therefore, you are all of more value than many sparrows. Thank you. There you are. You are more valuable than a sparrow. He said a sparrow doesn't fall without the father knowing. He, if he wants to know it, he can know it. So he's saying there that a farthing, a farthing is a copper coin. It's one sixteenth of a denarius. You say, what is a denarius? A denarius is one is it was one day's wages for a laborer. It would be like minimum wage. <laughs> the minimum wage is ten dollars. Well, uh, that farthing, I mean, that yeah, that farthing is one sixteenth of ten dollars. That's nothing. Nothing. So you're worth more than a far than a sparrow. God can take the small things and tell you great things if we just listen to Him. Many people are praying and they're wringing their hands. And they need to just take these scriptures that we're going to look at tonight and see what God has done for his faithful people. And it seems like it's so insignificant. It's not insignificant if you are out there and you lost an axe head and you cannot pay for it and you borrowed it and you know the law. And what are you going to do? That was a big thing to that guy. To us, it's nothing. And God answered, uh, Elijah, axe head floated. And a farthing here, he said, you're worth more than sparrows. And the farthing is sold for one sixteenth of a denarii. And a denarii is one day's wages for a common laborer. <laughs> That's nothing. That farthing is not worth that sparrow. Pardon? That's one half hour of labor. One half hour of labor. And that's what it's worth, a little sparrow. And a denarii wasn't anything. Let's go back to 2 Kings 4. Ed is here now, so we're going to ask Ed to go to work. 2 Kings 4 and verse 38 to 41. 2 Kings 4. Listen to this now. 2 Kings 4, 38 to 41. Okay. 2 Kings 4. These are little small things that we've heard about, and you hardly ever hear, hear uh, sermons on them. We kind of look at them, oh, that's kind of cute. This isn't cute. These people were in a bind. Listen to this now. And Elijah, and Elijah came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds his lap full, and came and shared them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that, the, that they cried out and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Thank you. Stop right there. It's a drought in the land. See, when, when droughts and things happen, it affects the people of God also. Some people don't realize that it affects them. When Elijah called for the drought for three and a half years, it affected him. These people here are going through a drought here, and, and there, there isn't very much to eat. And here Elisha comes there. And he said, get the big pot and sit it on the, set it on the fire there. And somebody says, one of the students went out into the field to gather herbs, and he found some wild vines. And he gathered there of gourds, and a, he had a bunch of them. He had his lap filled with, came back and shredded them into the pottage. They started cooking it. Wow, got cooked up real good. Big, nice meal, and they poured some out. And someone, I don't know, doesn't say how it happens. Oh, this stuff is poisonous. They've been eating it. And Elijah said, oh, okay, bring me some flour. It says meal, but the word is flour. 
And he took some flour and cast some flour into it, stirred it up and said, go on and eat it. There they got food now. The small thing is, it fed all of those men, it fed Elijah, and it was a small little thing, but still it was very important. And this uh, probably, some commentators said, this pro these probably were wild cucumbers. They can be fatally poisonous if eaten in large quantities. They were hungry and they were eating that soup fast. They were pouring it in. And just the right amount wouldn't be, wouldn't be poisonous, but it was. They, had to, to, they ate a large quantity. And the flour was a miraculous cure, was once accomplished. A, a miraculous cure was accomplished through putting that flour in there. God blessed what Elisha said. Come on. That didn't, you put flour in some poison, it's not going to change it. It's good to be around godly people. I'm, I'm telling the brethren that. I tell them over and over again. Some people don't have a service to go to. They don't have members of, to be around in the church of God. But there is something that God will do when people are together that are God's people. God provided for them some food, and they ate it. And, and that was a, a big pot of pottage, whatever may have been in it. And that was an accident. This, this person didn't go out purposely and deliberately find some poisonous gourds. This was an accident. And they and said, well, you can eat poisonous stuff and you, it's all right. Okay, let's go over to Matthew 16. Matthew 16 and verse 14 through 18. Matthew 16, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark 16. Mark 16. Uh, Rose, will you read Mark 16 and verse 14 through 18? Please. Mark 16, 14 through 18. Yes, in verse 14. See, this was an accident of getting this poison in his pot here. They didn't do it his own purpose. So we want to make sure Mark 16 is covered on this. Afterward, he appeared into the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Stop right there. Have you all ever heard of snake handlers? Yep. What does it say? Go out and handle snakes? No, it says if you take up a serpent, it will not hurt them. It does not mean you go out and take a serpent and play with it and put it around your neck and purposely do that. It's talking about doing something accidentally and it, it was not going to hurt you. And what happened here in this pottage, this man went out, whoever the students were, what were, he put some shredded up some gourds that looked good to him and it was poisonous. And then Elijah put the flour in and made it back normal again, made it not poisonous. But this is not talking about what Matthew is, is, is talking about, Mark is talking about. It's not something you do on purpose. Yes, Ed. That's, yes. John, it makes me think of Paul when he picked up, he was picking up sticks. Are you going there? Yes, we're going there. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you and, you and, you and Joshua, you know, it's doing everything. <laughs> Let's go over to Acts 28 and verse 1 through 6. Since it, since you found it, let's do that. See, the reason why we're going through this is because there are people that go out and find snakes on purpose and play with them and say, you don't have faith if, if they bite you. You don't have faith if you don't do that. That's not true. That's purposely doing. That's tempting God. You don't tempt God. You don't tempt him. If you accidentally do it, that's one thing. Acts 28 and verse 1 through 6, Ed. All right. And when they were escaped, 
Then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled the fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffered not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while, they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> Thank you. That was an accident completely. He went out and got some sticks and it was cold and rainy. It doesn't say well, what happened. He brought him in. He put it on the fire. And that viper was with this little sticks. And he jumped out and grabbed his hand. Paul well, shook it off and kept on working. That's not handling snakes. That's not tempting God. Anytime God promised you that he would do certain things, he would protect you, and then you say, okay, I'm going to see if you're going to do it or not. I don't know if you're really going to do it or not. I'm going to do something poisonous, dangerous, and see if you protect me. That's what the devil did to Christ. He said, get on this ledge. Didn't he say that? He said, it's written that he put have his angels charge over you. You won't even stub your toe again on the rock. Jump off and see if he will do that or not. Jesus said, it is written, you're not to tempt the Lord your God. You, don't, you can't tempt God with evil and sin. It is you question his character. That's why Israel got in trouble in, that, in the wilderness. They, question, they call him a liar. You don't question God's character. He will come back on you. And so this is what people are doing. They're saying, if you pound snakes, you know, what, that, that, and then, all right, you got faith that they don't bite you. If they bite you, well, then you don't have faith. You're tempting God. Paul did not tempt God. He was just doing some work and it accidentally found a serpent. He didn't find it. It was a serpent in there. He didn't know it. And the thing bit him. And he just shook it off. That is not mad, uh, Mark 16. Mark 16 says if you handle snakes. That is like that is like what Paul did. He didn't handle them, but a snake did bite him. And the same thing with the food. When uh, they got the pot, they didn't go out. And this man didn't go out and eat all those poison things. Said, These are poisonous. I'm going to see if God is going to protect us and not put poison in it. Now, eat them and see if he'll protect you. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's got to be accidental. Don't do things on purpose. And this is why we're going through this tonight. You see how these little small things pertain to our lives, about the small things, about the axe handle, I mean the axe head, and you being worth more than a, than a, a, a sparrow, here is talking about accidentally getting something that you really, you didn't do it on purpose. It's not tempting God you not to do that. That poisonous stuff was not to be eaten. And also I want to mention, it says in Mark 16 also, go back to Mark 16. Go back to Mark 16. We have brethren, and I've talked to some people recently concerning this. I'm not going to cover it very much on this, but I want you to see something and remember this. And old members know this. Mark 16, it says in verse 17, they shall speak with new tongues. And oh, that's so great. Tongues, tongues, tongues. The word there is glossolalia. It means languages. It doesn't mean there'd be a lot of crazy jumping around and screaming uh, in, in a not understandable language. The Bible teaches, in, uh, you read in 1 Corinthians 14, if someone is in service and they speak in a language, a language, there must be an interpreter there to interpret what that person is saying. If there's not an interpreter, he or she is to shut their mouths and not say one thing. Don't say one thing. And also in 1 Corinthians 14, you all can read this. It says, uh, unknown, that, that was put in there. Unknown tongues. And the word is uh, speaking a language. And you can read in uh, uh, Acts 2, 38, 
when on the day of Pentecost, they were speaking in various languages. And those people from all those nations understood. They said they are speaking in our own language. So the apostles were speaking, but the people from Arabia, people from Ethiopia understood it. It wasn't a bunch of gibberish. Yes, Ed. When I look at the Strong's definition, it's talking about, you know, implication of language. It says in parentheses, specifically one naturally acquired. Yep. A natural acquired language. And it has to be a language that's understood. You don't just say, say a bunch of wild stuff. There are people listening to and watching and getting involved with people jumping around saying stuff and saying stuff. And they don't know what they're saying. You don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're saying. But they say, oh, I'm filled with the spirit. They may be, but you don't want to be filled with that spirit. You don't want that part of your life. And so I just want to bring this up also concerning snakes and languages. If they speak in a language, okay, let's, let's, let's one more. Here it is. First, first Corinthians 12 and verse 1 to 3. First Corinthians 12. Now, this tells us right here, we're going to ask James to read this, please. First Corinthians 12 and verse 1 to 3. Listen to this. This is what I'm talking about. Someone slips in or comes in, and they come in and say, oh, they're speaking in languages. That's cool. And it can be a language sometimes, too, so watch it. First Corinthians 12 and verse 1 to 3. Read that, please, James. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye you know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. You know what was going on? The devil is real smart. Sometimes people speak in gibberish. You can't understand it. But this time they were speaking in a language. So you really got to watch it. Let's, let's, let's just say they were speaking in French. And someone interpreted. It's in French. But they were cursing Jesus. Right. They were judging the gift on experience. Not by content. What are they saying? So he's to, he can come at you both ways. He can come in with gibberish, and you can't understand it. That's nothing. He can come in and speak say, Spanish or French, and he's saying exactly, speaking in a language, and someone said he's saying this. They interpret it. But what he was saying was, curse Jesus. A cursed Jesus. That's not right. Jesus Christ, they won't say Christ, Jesus Christ became a curse. He wasn't cursed. If he was, we have no Savior. You can read it in Galatians. You can read that in Galatians 3 and verse 13. Christ became a curse for us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. We broke it. He became a curse. And so this person is speaking in so-called a language was speaking a language, but he was saying, Jesus a curse. Jesus a curse. He was cursing him. Jesus a curse. He was lying. Jesus was not a curse. You, you read first uh, Galatians 3 and verse 13. Read it. He became a curse for us. He who knew no sin, in Corinthians, became sin for us. That's what it is. But this is where the devil can come at people two ways. Gibberish and you want to understand it, or either you can come with a language, but the language contains false teachings. That's why Paul is saying, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. Jesus a curse. Wrong. And they say, oh, he's speaking in a language. So what is, what is he saying? Oh, he's, no, that's wrong doctrine. It's a lie. Jesus was not a curse. He became a curse for you and I. That's why I tell everyone, I know people don't preach it that much, Jesus died the second death for me and for you. He did not die the first death. Everyone, Hebrews 9, 27, must, every man must go through one death. I don't care who he is or what she is. They've got to die once. The one you don't want is the death of being a curse. That's the second death. Christ died the second death. 
If he died for the first death, we wouldn't die. That's what's so simple. This, this is why you need Bible study. This is why you need to study the scriptures. This is why you need to renew yourself on this stuff because it's coming at us on both sides and we have got to be strong enough to see it. And, it, and that's why I'm going through little things here that leads to big things. Let's go back to 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4, and we're going to ask, going to ask uh, James again. 2 Kings 4. Let me get that too, James. 2 Kings 4 and verse 42 to 44. 2 Kings 4, 42, I think. Yes, 42 to 44. Let's, let's, here's another little thing. Watch this. And there came a man from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn and the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. Watch this. And his servitor said, What? Should I set this before an hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, They shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he did set it before them, and they did eat, and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. Here you are. He came in and he brought the first fruits. The first fruits are normally go to the Levites and goes to the priesthood. But Elisha was serving God, and he brought it to the people he figured was serving God. He brought those 20 loaves and brought it there. He's like, we got 100 men. You can't feed all of these people with these 20 loaves. I said, serve them. What are you, we don't have enough. Serve them. What does this remind you of? <laughs> and, and then he served them. They, they, they ate and they were full and had stuff left over. Let's go over to, you know where we got to go. We got to go to Mark 6. Mark 6, and we're going to ask Ed again, since he has his reading glasses on tonight. <laughs> he said, serve them. The man said, this is not enough to serve all of these people. I told you to serve them. It is not enough to serve them. Thus says the Lord, you will have enough and some left over. Mark 6 and verse 31, Ed. This is Christ Jesus. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Hmm. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities. And it outwent them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he had come out, saw much people. And was moved with compassion toward them, because there was, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, "This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Mm -hmm. Send them away that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat." And he answered and said unto them. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Stop right there. Same thing Elisha said. Give them some food. What? Give them some food. That 20 loaves of bread isn't going to feed 100 men. And as Jesus said, give them food. Give them something to eat. Uh, uh, are you kidding? I think, um, and it said, we go and buy 200 penny loaves of bread and give to them to eat. I think that means a second. Uh, 200, that's about 200 denarii. A single denarii was approximately one day's wages. 200 denarii would be approximately eight months wages. You think the disciple had eight months wages in their pocket? So how can we do that? We, we, need, we need at least eight months wages of pay these, to buy food for these people. Three, verse 37 again is. He answered and said unto them, give ye, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? He said unto them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. Mm -hmm. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. 
That should do, baby. Okay, I'm going in. <laughs> and he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And when they did eat and were filled, they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. Stop right there. There it is. Same thing happened with Elijah. Didn't, didn't have enough to feed everyone. And he said, feed them. What? Feed them. Give it to them. <laughs> Just feed them. And Jesus took the bread here and he prayed over, he blessed it. And he had them sit down. Let me explain this a little bit. Here. I've been reading this, trying to figure this out in 50s and 100s. It's believed they were all, he had all of the men, and this, these are men, sit down in a semicircle, semicircle, 50 semicircles with each, with each with 100 men in it. He had them organized. And so they had one line of men here, one line of men here, one line of men, all in a semicircle. So you give it to the first man, he would pass it down this end, give it to the man behind him, man behind him, man behind him, or either he can come from the top down, 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 down. So semicircle, 50 people in each, I mean, 50 circles, 100 people. You know how many people that is? That's a lot of people. Not counting the women and children, because traditionally, the women and children ate together. So the men were sitting down in the semicircles, maybe the women too, but the men definitely were in those semicircles, 50 in a circle, 100 circles. That's covering all, all around there. And they put the women and the children by themselves, and they fed the 5,000 men and those children, they believe roughly may have been 20,000 people. Yes, sir. Matthew is the one that says, uh, that confirms just what you said. Mm -hmm. It says in Matthew, it said, uh, we're about 5,000 men beside yeah. women and children. So yes. Matthew confirms it. Yes, that's what he did. And they only had five and two, two fish and five. He said, feed them. Can you guess how it, we don't understand this miracle because it's a miracle above miracle. It's very similar to Lot getting out of Sodom and Gomorrah. They woke up that morning and, and they say, he said, get out of here. If running, you cannot, how, how many miles can you run at full speed? Um, not too much. If you walk, I can walk a mile in 15 minutes. But he had to get outside of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. No way he could walk that fast. The angels took them and it says, and set them outside of the city. That's what it says. You read it. Here, with all of these people, how did they serve 5,000 men and all of the women and children, too? It would take you, how many hours would it take to break the bread and pass it down, break the bread? That, that was a miracle to feed that many people, not only the amount of bread, but how it was done. You need to realize when God works miracles, he wants to leave an impression, he will leave it. Do you think they forgot that? They never forgot that. I've been over to the Dukes, not Dukes, but years ago, over the baseball stadium, and they had a thousand people. Uh, yeah, the Dukes, they had uh, 1,200 people there. And that place looked crowded to me. And you take 1,200 people, how long would it take you to, even with bread, to break it down and give every 1,200 people a piece of bread? You go over there and there are 5,000 people there, and you would really have a job on your hands for hours trying to get all that bread to all of those people and the women and children, and then go out and pick up a basket and pick it all up. God worked a miracle in that whole, whole area over five loaves and two fish. And those people, they followed him. The next day they came to where, where is that man that fed us? And Jesus said, you came over for the food. I know that. He knew that. But that was a miracle above miracles, and we haven't sat down and thought about it enough. It was more than just the five loaves and the two fish. It was how it was done, the order. You get five, you get five thousand men together, and you get the women and children, and you bring some food out. You're going to have a little disorder. 
<laughs> they're going to be reaching and grabbing and so on and forth. And they, they sat down real quietly and peacefully, and they passed it out. They passed it out and passed it out and passed it out. I don't know how it was done. I know he fed them. They, when he, how many baskets did they take up after they when they would eat the debris? And, oh, 12 baskets was left over on the ground. They, they ate and ate and ate and ate and ate. And they couldn't eat any one that's left by the bread on the ground. Little things, two little fish, five little loaves. Jesus Christ affected 20,000 people at one time. And you think you're not important. You are one person that God has brought with his own son. He said you're worth more than a, a, a sparrow. You're, you're worth more than, than, than a strand of hair. And I can count every strand of hair on your head if I wanted to, he said. He can do that. God can do that. Yes, he can. He knew the firstborn in Egypt of man and beast and even strangers in prison. They knew the firstborn of, of those guys in prison. He knew the firstborn of your sheep of your cattle, of your camels. He knew that. And he knew every firstborn man and woman there. How did he know that? I don't know. How does he know his church right now? By his spirit dwelling in you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every step you take. He knew me when we stopped down there outside of Fort Sumner and that car couldn't stop. Maybe sent an angel, maybe an angel's already there. I don't know what he did. I don't care what he did. He got my car started. This person lost his hearing aid. He didn't care how it was done. He just, oh, I need this hearing aid. I need it. I need it. And there it was on the ground. He looked and looked and he couldn't find it. All at once he looked over and saw a little, like it's kind of flickering. Oh, what is that? There it is. Oh, whoa. Little things to big things. And I haven't forgotten about their car. And they put all these people here and they really believe there were 20,000 roughly men, women, and children. I mean, men and not counting the women and children. Let's go over to Matthew 15. Uh, Rose, go to Matthew 15. And this goes right back to Elisha, doesn't it? And they're feeding those people, feed them. Well, feed them. We don't have enough food for them. We don't have eight months wages, get in town here and buy it. And I don't think any store would have that much food in it back in that day and time without mass production. They didn't have uh, loaves of bread baked up on the shelf in plastic. Uh, Matthew 15 and verse 30 through 38. Did I ask someone to read? Rose, okay. Matthew 15, 15, verse 30 through 38. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, hmm. and he healed them, insomuch that he mul the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness <laughs> as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them and gave them, gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did eat and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were 4,000 men beside women and children. Uh, verse 39. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. This isn't talked about very this one's feeding 4,000. He has seven, uh, seven uh, loaves of bread here and, uh, and some fishes. He fed 4,000. Same way he fed those other group. And some say, oh, this is just a different version. No, I want to prove to you it isn't. This is another time he fed 4,000. 
thousand people and may have been the same way men not counting the women it says there were four thousand men beside women and children yeah he did he did it from seven fish i mean uh, two some little fishes and seven loaves of bread oh you of little faith he says he says to us will you read the scriptures and see what i've done see what the father has done and see what i have done for one person two people these were not disciples in the sense of apostle. They were just there. They were bringing in the sick and laying them down at his feet. The lame, the blind, the, the, those possessed with demons. Do something for this person. They were helpless. And he had compassion on them. He healed them and then he fed them. They had been following him three days. Three days. And he, these are not, we would have to say, not converted. <laughs> They're not his disciples. They were just following him for what they could get from him. And we're not. You're not following Christ for what you just get from him. I'm not. I better not. We shouldn't be because then we'll be committing, uh, uh, we'll be covetous. He said, be careful of covetousness. Two different uh, uh, occasions. You said, show that to me. Turn over to Mark 8. I'm going to ask Joshua, will you read that Mark 8 and verse 14? Mark 8 and verse 14. I'm, ask, I'm asking people to read these scriptures, read these old scriptures. As one person told me, ah, oh, it's good to read some of those old scriptures sometime because we are so advanced. Now we don't need this. We do, and we're going to need it more as man de dehumanize human beings. Animals are more important than people right now. They really are. You, you heard an animal, they have three in court and sent to jail three or four or five years. You heard a person, yeah, we gave you six and six weeks or uh, six months of uh, suspended sentence. Mark 8 and verse 14. Will you start reading there, please? Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. Hmm. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said, said unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Have you, have you your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see you not? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I break the five, the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you not that ye, that ye do not understand? Stop. That's the proof right there. Those are two different events. The five and the four. Feeding the five and the four. Some say, oh, that's the same thing he just wrote it. No, he did it twice. This is proof right here. He said, Do you remember how many baskets you took, took up when I spread five spirit? When I fed the 5,000? Yeah. Do you remember when, how many baskets you took up when I fed the 4,000? Yeah. He did both of them. I fed those people. They were not this, they were not saints, but I fed them. This is proof right here that he did that. And the order that he had, how he did those things was a miracle of the bread, of the fish, of the, of the people, the numbers, how they fed them. I don't know how it worked out. Somebody's sitting there hungry, and all at once there's some bread coming by, and you break a piece off and pass it down, back to break a piece off. And how, those 12 disciples couldn't hustle around all 12 of them. If they had one man in each 50 groups, 100 groups, it, you got to get it to this person all out here, over here, and he has to pass it down. And they kept breaking it off, breaking it off, breaking it off. He was breaking it off. That was a miracle to watch. That was something to watch for those people who were not his apostles, who were not his really true disciples. They were there to get the bread and get the healing and go back home and say, praise God. Because they didn't want to break through, they were a little afraid to break the traditions and go against the Pharisees. So that's one reason why they were out in the middle of the field. You notice Pharisees are not out there. They don't go and they, they are city slickers. They're not there. <laughs> they don't go out into the boonies. But this is proof right here that that 5,000 and the 4,000 were separate. And what we need to do, I'm going to give one more verse here. 
I'm going to ask James if you will read Matthew 7 and we'll go home. Matthew 7 and verse 7. Because the brethren need to look at themselves and stop allowing things that are bothering them so much and it begins to take you and take your value away and you begin to think that towards God also. God has always valued you, always. Matthew 7 and verse 7 through 12. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. What man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Thank you. Verse 11, I want to make one verse clear in here. If you then being evil, the word therefore evil is paneros, it means hurtful, in effect, or influence, in a bad way. Acts that you do, not your character. You don't have, he didn't, he didn't say you, disciple, or evil character. You do things that hurt people sometimes. You don't do the right thing sometimes. But if your son asked you for some bread, would you give him a serpent? No way. Or if he asked you for a fish, would you give him a scorpion? What? No way. You wouldn't do that. How much more does your heavenly father, will he give you good things if you ask him? See, we don't approach God like that. Talk to, that's, Jesus said it. He said, you, you do things good for your physical children. You wouldn't give them poison. No way would you handle your, handle your son a serpent. Say, Dad, I need a piece of bread. You go and find a scorpion. Here it is. And scorpion. You wouldn't do that. And we can hurt people. We do hurt people at times. But we wouldn't hurt our children like that. What about this and you? This is what I want. I, I, I need it myself. All of us need it because we live in a time, you know this, when people are being degraded, misused, abused, I don't care who they are, politicians or whatever, including preachers, messing over people for their own personal benefit, that means they are devaluing you and up and de uh, of e evaluating themselves up higher. And I'm, these scriptures tonight, I know we're gonna cut it short. There are other scriptures we'll go through later on. I want you to look at some of the small things, little things that we pass over as cute and sentimental, and they are profound. Everything over here with Elijah and Elijah did, everything that Christ did, those are profound things because God made this a serious book. It's not a joking book at all. All of these things are profound in here, and this is a scripture we should end up with, and James read it. If you then being at times hurtful to other people, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give, good th give them that ask him? Take that before the throne of grace. Oh, come on, John. Take that before the throne of grace. You're asking for something. Don't let's beat around the bush and be afraid. Christ said do that. So we'll stop there and we'll end the Bible study. Heavenly Father, the Bible says God is faithful. You are faithful, full of trustworthiness. You cannot lie. You cannot. And Father, I ask you, whomsoever comes to you with your words, your actions that we read here tonight, these are things for us, Father. They are for saints of God. You showed Elijah, you showed Elisha, you showed what you would do for people that were faithful in a little small, insignificant manner of an accident. How much more valuable are your children that Christ died for and, and ransomed with his own life? Build that into the faith of your people, Father, that they will believe it, trust it, and stay before your throne continuously and if they have to, keep bringing this back again and again, like the widow did, again and again. 
And Father, we ask for your blessing upon us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.